to the 2020 annual lecture of the Peter Sowerby Project in Philosophy and Medicine. I am Maria Alvarez and I'm the head of the philosophy department at King's, which is where the project is housed. And I'm very soon going to pass the mic over to Alexander Bert, who, as many of you know, is the outgoing Sowerby chair and who is going to, as well as introduce the new chair, who's been newly appointed, chair this evening's lecture. But before that, I want to say a few things about Alexander. Now, I don't have, I cannot say too much because it's a very packed schedule today. And so I'm not going to be able to do justice to what a wonderful chair and what a wonderful colleague Alexander has been. But I, I'll be able to say a little bit about those two things. So I think as a chair, Alexander has displayed all the qualities that one could wish. He's displayed leadership, vision, total dedication, enthusiasm, and support for everybody in the project, no matter how important or how, as you were, junior. And he's really taken the, the vision of the project on board. He has been a fantastic teacher to medical students, very successful and has engaged also with professional medics in GP formation and, and development. He's engaged in lots, lots of initiatives with people, which I'm sure many of whom are here today, who also teach philosophy throughout the world, trying to promote new initiatives and invigorating that very important aspect of medical formation. He's done that while, of course, being engaged and participating and organizing all the events of the project also producing amazingly good work related to the project, like his work on the replication crisis and what he did at the beginning of the COVID and continued to do at the COVID uh, crisis on the R factor. And he's managed to do that while also publishing his own wonderful, excellent philosophy work, which is really outstanding. Uh, being a very, very supportive supervisor to a number of research students, and being a highly valued member of the philosophy department, engaged in every aspect of it. And also anybody who knows Alexander will know that he does that with his characteristic good humor and assuming manner, utter sort of common sense and, you know, friendliness. And so I think it's no wonder that Cambridge wanted him as a chair. We're, we are very sad to see him go. Of course, we wish him well. But above all, we want to say thank you very much, Alexander, for everything you've done for the project and, and for the department. So over to you. Uh, gosh, uh, Maria, thank you very much for those extremely kind words, uh, which I wasn't e expecting. But it's just to say that the, the feelings of admiration between me and the King's Philosophy Department are, are, are entirely mutual. And it's been sad to, to, to leave. Um, well, it's nice to be able to say that after those those nice things said about me, that I can you know, assure everyone that the the, the uh, project is going to be in extremely good hands uh, with my successor, um, Elselin Kingma. But before I introduce uh, Elselin to those who don't know her, perhaps I should say a little bit about what the chair is and the project that Maria has referred to. So the Philosophy and Medicine Project at King's and the Peter Sowerby Chair are generously funded by the Peter Sowerby Foundation, uh, which was uh, set up by uh, Peter Sowerby, a Yorkshire GP, whose personal wealth was generated by, uh, on the basis of software that he and a colleague developed for uh, managing medical records in a GP surgery. Um, and he decided, Peter Sowerby decided to use this wealth for charitable purposes, which focused on medical research, healthcare, education, community, and the environment. And amongst the initiatives that his foundation uh, have uh, supported are the, um, this philosophy and medicine project at, at King's and the Peter Sowerby uh, professor. And so it's a delight for me to be able to introduce the uh, new, the incoming uh, Peter Sowerby professor, who is um, Elsa Lynn Kingma, who comes to King's from the University of uh, Southampton, 
um, but she's also been uh, Socrates Professor in Philosophy and Technology at the Technical University of Eindhoven in the uh, Netherlands. Um, Elselin's uh, research focuses in particular on uh, the philosophy of medicine, of course, especially concepts of health and disease, the epistemology of evidence-based medicine, and the role of values in medical evidence and clinical decision-making. She's also particularly interested in uh, the philosophy of pregnancy, uh, birth and early motherhood, um, especially the rights and obligations of pregnant and birthing women, as well as healthcare providers. Um, she's interested in you've done research on the nature of pregnancy and applications such as artificial gestation and contract pregnancy. And uh, Elsalyn Kingler leads the um, European Research Council research project, Better Understanding the Metaphysics of Pregnancy, Better Understanding the Metaphysics of Pregnancy, which has the acronym BUMP, of course. Well, we, we can, we'll forgive her uh, that. Um, which is a project at the intersection of um, biology, medicine, and metaphysics, uh, investigating the metaphysical relationship between uh, the fetus and the maternal organism, as one might put it. Um, last year, Elselin was awarded the very prestigious uh, Philip Leverhulme Prize to, in order to look into the metaphysical, ethical, epistemological, and existential puzzles um, presented by uh, birth and uh, pre pregnancy. So I don't know whether um, no, Elselin might be around somewhere. Is Els um, Yeah, yeah, Elselin, I'm here. Yeah. Why don't you say hello? Say hello, Elselin. Hello. <laughs> hello. I don't think I should say any more, but thank you, Alexander. It's a lot no, to but... live up. So, hello, I'm Elselin. Thank you very much, Elson. Well, we're, we're looking forward to, to you. Know, Kings is looking forward to um, your, your arrival in, in, in the chair. And it's a pleasure to me to, to know that it's going to be in you know, such wonderful hands in the future. We're going to go to ever onwards and upwards, so to speak. Um, um, I should point out that in the meantime, there's been this interregnum. Um, and Harriet Feigerberg has done a wonderful job of uh, leading the project in in the period between me and Elselin. And not only has she sort of kept the show on the road in these very difficult times, but has in fact moved things onwards and further forward. And I, I think she's done a wonderful uh, job. And in particular, over the last few months, has run a series of um, workshops and a conference and numerous colloquia um, dedicated to different aspects of the relationship between philosophy and medical education, and which reflects very much um, Peter Sowerby's view that uh, there should be this close relationship, this involvement of philosophy in the education of medical students. Um, uh, to use Galen's words, the best physician is also a philosopher, so it's something we take very seriously in Kings, not only in the, in the Department of Philosophy, but also in the uh, GKT Medical School. Okay, Harriet, you have something to do now, which is to, to mention the, well, a, a prize. That's right, yeah, thank you so much, Alexander, for uh, the kind words. Um, so um, I'm going to be announcing the winner of the annual Peter Sowerby essay contest on behalf of the panel of judges. So um, the annual Peter Sowerby essay contest is awarded each year in recognition of an outstanding essay written by a student on an issue uh, relevant to the relation between philosophy and medicine. This year, um, we had the topic bias in clinical medicine, can it be overcome? And we asked the contributors to the essay contest to reflect on whether and to what extent medical research and practice could rise to overcome the unjust impacts of bias in medicine. The winning essay was entitled Bias in Clinical Medicine, Can It Be Overcome? And it considered the discrepancies in care that patients receive for pain in Western healthcare systems and also explored how different kinds of bias uh, might be more or less resistant to being mitigated in the ways that we might want to mitigate them. Um, the panel of judges had the following to say about the winning essay. Um, 
This thoughtful, well-written essay draws a novel and useful distinction between epistemic and essentializing bias and advances a persuasive argument that they must be treated differently in medicine. Another judge called it an elegantly written essay um, which offered a penetrating analysis of the dangers of bias in medicine um, and an excellent essay with clarity, concision and a confident philosophical voice. So I'm really, really pleased to announce that the winner of the 2020 Peter Sauerby Essay Contest is Kate Fisk. I think Kate is here as well. Uh, are you here, Kate? I'm here. Hi, thank you. Thank you so much for <laughs> comments. That's really lovely. <laughs> Hi Kate, um, congratulations. So Kate is a final year MPhil student in philosophy at University College London. Her research focuses on the dismissal of women's pain by medical professionals in Western healthcare systems um, and she employs the tools of feminist social epistemology and feminist philosophy of language in her analysis of these issues. Kate uh, also has a wider interest in issues such as moral psychology and legal philosophy. So um, congratulations uh, very much to Kate for a really wonderful achievement and a really wonderful essay um, that us on the judging panel really, really enjoyed reading. Um, and uh, with that, I think I'll hand back to Alexander. Thank you. Thank you, Harriet, and, and well done, Kate. Um, okay, so it's a real pleasure to introduce the 2020 Peter Sowerby uh, lecturer, who is Robin Bloom. Uh, Robin is uh, associate professor at Michigan State University, but she holds a joint appointment there between the Department of Philosophy and the Lyman Briggs College. Um, Lyman Briggs College is a, a science-focused college within Michigan State University, which is committed to connecting natural sciences and mathematics on the one hand, and humanities and social sciences on the uh, other. And so you, Robin, in holding this joint appointment, um, we rather reflects exactly what we're trying to do uh, uh, at King's, um, or the project, is uh, the uh, Saudi project that King's is trying to do, is link um, philosophy and, and medicine. And indeed, that's exactly what she does in her research, which examines philosophical issues in uh, neuroscience and in medicine, uh, with a particular emphasis on the ethical and epistemological questions in those areas. Uh, she's written extensively on the philosophy of evidence-based practice and, and also on the use of uh, functional neuroimaging in psychiatry. Um, she's the, uh, Robin Z, co-editor of the Bloomsbury Companion to Philosophy of Psychiatry and, um, and, and she has particular interest in, as well in the interest in the intersection of feminist theory and cognitive science and bioethics and has has or does edit um, um, two journals in that area neurofeminism and the international journal of feminist approaches to bioethics so yeah, yeah a wonderful person exactly the right kind of person to be the 2020 peter sowerby annual lecture and her and lecture is entitled uh, what does it mean to be healthy over to you robin Uh, thank you very much, and thank you, Alexander and Harriet, for the invitation. I'm really excited to be here. I also want to thank everybody who has taken the time out of their day for yet another Zoom meeting. I know many of us are living on Zoom at the moment, and it's exhausting. Um, so I will try to um, keep everybody awake. <laughs> I, I'm going to share my slides, which, as I'm sure you know, um, when you are doing this in a Zoom meeting, you have to announce it first uh, so that people know that that's what you're doing. Um, there we go. So this is a question that I have been thinking quite a bit about lately, and I'm at the phase of thinking about it where I um, change my mind about the answer to this question fairly regularly. So I am hoping that um, I get some interesting discussion and am able to become a little bit more uh, certain in what I think about the answer to this question. Uh, just an outline of the talk, I'm going to focus as a, a way of starting on the definition of health given by the World Health Organization and to introduce some of the criticisms of that definition. I'm then going to look at work in philosophy of medicine 
that looks at the nature of health and disease and illness, which of course are interrelated concepts. Um, I think that the work in philosophy of medicine does have a lot to offer, but that none of the work that's being done really addresses the question that I'm interested in, which is what it means to be healthy. And I want to address that question, not just in terms of trying to find a definition for health, but to actually think about the meaning of health for people who um, consider themselves to be healthy, despite having often very significant health problems. Uh, so what I will do after discussing the philosophy of medicine is look at some qualitative studies uh, in which uh, researchers work with people who have a chronic health condition to try to understand what health means for them. And then having identified some of the themes in that literature, I'll talk briefly about what the implications of this literature are for a definition of health. So beginning with the World Health Organization, um, in the preamble to the WHO's constitution, they give this famous definition of health, which says that health is a state of complete physical, mental, and social well-being, and not merely the absence of disease or infirmity. And this was welcomed at the time for going well beyond the traditional view of health, which simply focused on the absence of disease and infirmity. Uh, and yet, it's this expansion that has led to criticisms. I, I think you can divide the criticisms into three main types. The first type takes issue with the uh, complete characterization of, of well-being or the, the suggestion that well-being needs to be complete. So Mordecai and Sobel um, have said that if this definition is taken literally, it's meaningless because it's hopelessly utopian. Nobody can achieve complete physical, mental, and social well-being. A second criticism, as exemplified by the bioethicist Dan Callahan, looks at the inclusion of social well-being in addition to physical and mental well-being. And Callahan's worry is that this defines all social problems, such as crime and poverty, as health problems. So it's much too expansive as a definition of health. And then in 2019, Fallon and Karlowish talked about the idea that the um, definition is actually outdated. Uh, a lot has happened in health and healthcare since 1948, and the um, relative eradication of infectious diseases means that we need to be able to think about um, health in the context of an aging population, um, many members of which have chronic disease. I'll just note that a lot has happened since 2019 as well, uh, though I think that despite the current worries about infectious diseases, there's still something really important about Fallon and Carlowish's concerns. And in fact, that's really mostly what I'm going to be focusing on. The longer title of my talk is, what does it mean to be healthy when our understanding of health has to accommodate illness? So one place to look for an answer to this is at work in the philosophy of medicine. Questions about the nature of health, disease, and illness have been central to the philosophy of medicine for several decades. There are three main approaches to addressing this problem, naturalism, phenomenology, and normativism. And those of you who work in this area will um, perhaps notice that I'm not introducing these ideas in chronological order for a reason that I will make clearer. Um, naturalism is the probably oldest of the views. Normativism came next and work on the phenomenology of illness has recently become uh, much more popular and influential. I also want to look at a recent um, project by uh, Dr. Javi Carell, uh, who gave the first Sowerby lecture and covered some of the same topics that I'm going to be talking about. Uh, Carell has uh, drawn on work in nursing and social science research on health within illness to uh, further develop the phenomenology of medicine. Um, so this is a, a relative newcomer. It really is a, a 
building on the phenomenological tradition, but I, I'm going to say that I think this is probably the closest to um, the way that I have been thinking about how to answer the, the question, the guiding question for my talk. So naturalism is generally most exemplified by Christopher Bourse's biostatistical theory. Um, Bourse is a philosopher who wanted to engage in conceptual analysis. He was primarily interested in the concept of disease, and so his definition of health builds on and is rooted in his concept of disease. Um, I should point out that when philosophers of medicine talk about disease, they're using that as a shorthand for a variety of concepts that we often distinguish among in uh, healthcare and in day to day life. So, disease for philosophers includes things like injuries and syndromes and disabilities, in addition to the things that we would think of as being paradigm cases of disease. So Morse wants to give a purely biological uh, account of disease. He draws on um, medical research and evolutionary theory to talk about the biology of disease as being, um, a, 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 he defines disease as something that uh, is a physical state that lowers the ability to function, where function is cash evolutionary terms. Um, What's important, I think, for my purposes in this talk is that Bourse aims to give a value-free account of disease. He, he describes this as being a purely theoretical concept as opposed to a clinical concept. In some places, he, he describes himself as being interested in the pathologist's account of disease rather than the clinician's. His work on health is, um, again, derived from his work on disease. Roughly, he says he wants to accept the traditional medical notion that health is the absence of disease. So this is the um, thing that the World Health Organization definition is disagreeing with, is, is denying is the case. What I want to point out, though, is that on this account, very, very few people are healthy. Um, remember that philosophers take a very expansive concept of disease. And so any sort of injury or, defer, uh, or infirmity um, will count as a disease. So you can see that I am wearing eyeglasses. Without them, I would not be able to see my own computer screen. Um, for Bourse, this is um, an indication that I am not an entity uh, blessed with the absence of disease, and therefore I'm not healthy. This is, and again for Bourse, no, he does not see this as a problem given his interests. Um, he is um, willing to accept that. But at the same time, I think most people would want to say that we need an account of health that is more expansive than uh, the account that Boris is willing to, you know, that, that, that Boris is providing us with. Work in phenomenology of medicine uh, also takes issue with the um, focus on disease, and the reason for that is that uh, disease is held to be a third-person, objective, medical, scientific concept, and it's incapable of dealing with the first-person perspective, with the experience of disease or illness. So the phenomenological approach starts with illness and aims to um, understand and unpack what the experience of illness means. Um, and here, Javi Carell has been uh, very influential and justifiably so um, contributor to this discussion. Um, in her book, Illness, um, she describes illness as a systematic shift in the way the body experiences, acts, and reacts as a whole. And she says that the change in illness is not local, but global. It's not external, it's at the heart of subjectivity. Another influential yeah. um, phenomenologist of medicine is Frederick Spinaeus. Spinaeus um, agrees with Carroll's characterization, but emphasizes that illness, in addition to affecting our experience of our own selves and of our bodies 
also affects our experience in the world. So he defines illness as unhomelike being in the world, and he's drawing on Heidegger here. Um, he says that illness amounts to finding oneself in an alienating mood that involves the whole world of the suffering person, um, and that we can find ourselves in a pattern of disorientedness, resistance, helplessness, and perhaps even despair in um, situations of illness. So what phenomenology shows us is that the experience of illness has two facets, um, bodily suffering and pain, and also diminished ability to act in or engage with the world. And just as Bors uses his primary interest in disease to define health, phenomenologists use their primary interest in illness to define health. And health for traditional phenomenologists, and I'll say more about that in a minute, is the absence of illness. As Carell puts it, and this is drawing on Merleau-Ponty and on Heidegger, um, the healthy body is transparent, taken for granted. We do not stop to consider any of its functions and processes because as long as everything is going smoothly, these are part of the bodily background that enable more interesting things to take place. I'll say more about that in a minute, but now I want to turn to the third uh, approach to studying um, or to, to uh, philosophizing about health, disease, and illness, which is a normativist approach. Um, again, this is a, an older uh, tradition than the at least contemporary phenomenology of medicine. Um, and the reason that I am talking about this third is that the normativists are the ones who start with the concept of health and try to give a, a positive definition of health rather than starting with a different but related concept and defining health in terms of the absence of that concept. So for normativists, health is the ability to achieve one's goals. And there's a lot of disagreement among normativists as to which goals are important. Um, Leonard Nordenfeld has probably the most influential normativist approach. He defines uh, the relevant goal, or he describes the relevant goals as vital goals. Elsewhere, he talks about these as being the individual's most important goals, the ones that are most central to their well being. And the idea is that stipulating that these are, are vital goals, uh, are, are central, um, rules out the uh, possibility that trivial goals or relatively trivial goals will be important to health. And I'll say a little bit more about that later as well. A couple of interesting things about Nordenfeldt's view is that he takes health to be potentially diminished by factors other than illness. So anything that prevents somebody from achieving a vital goal does diminish their health. He has the example of Lily, who wants to run a marathon, but is unable to do so. And it's not that she's unable to do so because she is sick, because of a, a health condition that is preventing her. Maybe she didn't train hard enough. Maybe she's just not ready to run a marathon. And Nord Nordenfeld says that because running a marathon is a vital goal for her and she's unable to achieve it, Lily is less than fully healthy. That said, there's a close connection for Nordenfeld between health and illness. Illness occurs when health is diminished beyond a certain point. So we can be less than fully healthy without being ill. But as we become unable to achieve fewer of our vital goals, we become less healthy and health gradually shades into illness. Another point I want to make before moving on is that Lily can improve her health in two different ways. One, she can continue to train until the point where she is able to achieve her vital goal of running a marathon. Or second, she can change her vital goal. She can decide that running a marathon is no longer a vital goal for her. And in doing that, her health on Nordenfeldt's account increases. And I think that that's really counterintuitive for a lot of people, including me. Um, but I think that it actually does get at something important about um, health and illness that, again, I'll return to later. Sorry, that's Gus meowing in the background. He's a philosopher, too. 
So having looked at all three of these um, influential approaches in philosophy of medicine, we can summarize by saying that both naturalism, which focuses primarily on disease, and phenomenology, which focuses primarily on illness, provide negative definitions of health in that they define health in terms of what it isn't. For naturalists, health is the absence of disease. For phenomenologists, health is the absence of illness. Normativists provide a positive definition of health. They try to say what health is rather than what health isn't. And they view health and illness as occurring on a spectrum. But ultimately, they still think that health is incompatible with illness because illness is a diminution of health beyond a certain point. So while there may still be some health left, if um, you can still achieve some of your vital goals. Once you have lost enough health to be considered ill on the normativist approach, um, the amount of health that you have left to you is, is quite small. But there's a fourth alternative to um, thinking philosophically about the nature of health. And this draws on the literature in nursing and in uh, social science research on what's called health within illness. So this can be traced back to the work of Susan Mock in the late 1980s. Um, she describes health within illness as viewing illness as essential, uh, and says that the experience of illness can accelerate personal, that should be personal growth, not personal grown, um, can accelerate personal growth through increased awareness and transformational change. Uh, in 1996, Lindsay published a qualitative study of interviews of, with people living with chronic illness that uses this health with illness framework and identifies six different aspects of health within illness. Um, she refers to honoring the self, seeking and connecting with others, creating opportunities, celebrating life, transcending the self, and acquiring a state of grace as being components of health within illness. And I don't have time to talk in detail about these things that she's identified, but I've included them because I think they really encapsulate something central to this tradition of thinking about health within illness, that it views health within illness, it views illness as potentially being a very spiritual experience and something that um, can be very meaningful to people. And as I mentioned earlier, Javi Carell has drawn on this literature to expand the discussion in phenomenology of illness. Um, again, in the first Sowerby lecture, she discussed this and drew on empirical literature, asking people to rate their own health. Um, and she identified some uh, odd things in that literature, including the fact that people who have serious health concerns often rate their subjective health much higher than their objective health state would seem to indicate, um, and that uh, people who are healthy tend to think that life with an illness is uh, much more negative, much less uh, compatible with a sense of well-being and health than people who are experiencing a serious health condition um, would uh, rate their health themselves. But an interesting thing is that while Carol, ex Carol explicitly draws on the health within illness tradition, she tends to use the terms happiness or well-being instead of health. And I think part of the reason for that is well-being in particular is a concept that's very closely related to health. They often get used interchangeably uh, within the empirical and philosophical literature. The Kuh's definition of health defines health in terms of well-being. But I think that there's another issue and that this is the specific kinds of illness experiences that Carell focuses on. So in her 2018 book, Phenomenology of Illness, she says that when she talks about illness, she refers to serious, chronic, and life-changing ill health. 
as opposed to a cold or a bout of tonsillitis, so as opposed to acute illness. Um, she refers to situations in which the onset of illness is not followed by complete recovery within a short period of time. And while she acknowledges that different types of ill health, different health conditions are going to have very different effects on health or well-being and self-perceived health and well-being, she does also tend to focus on illnesses that have a dramatic effect on every facet of uh, an individual's life. And I think this is very important work, and I view the things that I'm going to be talking about next as being complementary to and expanding on that. Um, but I also worry that focusing on those severe, uh, completely disruptive conditions also um, limits what we can say about the relationship between illness and health. And the second bullet point, I, I think it helps me to uh, articulate my thinking on, on this idea. So I mentioned earlier that in traditional phenomenology, the healthy body has been considered to be transparent. We can just ignore our bodies and go about our life. And that, I, I said that leader um, thinks about this in terms of complacency, that when we are healthy, we, don't, we, we can afford to not think about our bodies. And Carell points out that the idea of a healthy body being, even in traditional phenomenological approaches, um, is a bit of an idealization that we all have experiences in which we become acutely aware of our bodies, um, whether that's uh, through our inability to do something that we um, think we should be able to do, um, to uh, cases of um, exercise. So athletes, I think, are very aware of their bodies and um, you know, they, they are also certainly, uh, at least potentially a paradigm case of, of good health. So if we think about the healthy body as being at least sort of transparent or transparent in the idealized sense, Carell says that there's two ways of thinking about the healthy, transparent body. On one account, we think of it as existing on a continuum with, as she puts it, the conspicuous ill body, um, so that these healthy experiences of our bodies, whether positive or negative, are continuous with the kinds of bodily experience that we have in illness. Alternatively, we can think about the healthy body and the ill body as discontinuous so that health and illness are distinctive bodily states in which modes of being and experience differ radically. And she suggests that overall the discontinuity view is the stronger one. I would like to challenge that, I think, or at least to um, consider the possibility that at least some experience of illness are much closer to the kinds of bodily experiences that we have when we are healthy. And to do that, I want to look at some empirical research looking at the concept of health. And some of you may know that there is conservatively estimated a ton of research on um, illness experiences and on perceptions of health, but I wanted to find something that's fairly specific. I wanted to find things in which people are not just asked whether they are healthy, but also encouraged to think about what um, health actually means and to articulate what health actually is for them. So what it means to them when they say that they are healthy. And uh, it turns out that there is some research that does this, but um, it's, there's not as much of it as I would have liked to have been able to find. One study that I, I think most centrally addresses this question is a paper published by Simon et al, in which they um, asked people what, the, uh, what went into their assessments of themselves as being healthy. Um, they start by pointing out that 
the studies in health research often ask participants, how is your health in general? And um, they will ask them to answer on a scale from very good to good to fair to poor. Um, and this is exactly what Simon and colleagues did, but then they followed up with a question asking people what factors went into their decision, why they gave the answer that they did. And one of the interesting things about this study is that half of their participants had a chronic illness and half didn't. There were both similarities and differences between the groups. So both groups talked about physical characteristics um, specifically things like the presence or absence of physical diseases or physical problems and also um, limitations to their abilities. Uh, both groups also mentioned well-being, just simply the experience of feeling well, though this was more common in the group that did not have chronic illness. And it was only people with a chronic illness that talked about the idea of coping as being central to health. And I mean, this in one sense makes a lot of sense. If you are not ill, then coping with illness is not part of your self-concept related to health. Um, but I think that this coping dimension is something that it can help us to think a little bit about what health means in the context of chronic illness. The study does not say a whole lot about what coping consists in. They mention um, adapting to illness, having a positive attitude, and in a couple of cases, uh, comparison with others who are worse off. I, I'm not entirely sure why the researchers put that last factor under coping, though it is a theme that comes up in some of this literature. People with an illness compare their own current health state to uh, those of others that they know with similar health conditions or with no health conditions and also to themselves in the past before they became ill. So in thinking about this coping dimension, I looked at studies that are um, also qualitative that focus on um, individuals with particular health conditions. And given my interest in fleshing out the um, realm of health in the case of people who have a chronic health condition, who are in Bourse's terms diseased, um, and who do have in at least some, uh, at, at least some points in their life experiences of the illness, um, but who don't have severe life altering conditions that, um, are that overtake their entire identity. Um, and one of these studies looked at individuals who have either thrombophilia, which is a condition linked to um, genetics that makes people more likely than usual to develop blood clots, um, and also people with asthma. And this seems like an odd pairing, but the rationale is that both of these are what the authors um, call long-term conditions, which are conditions that um, can be, uh, sorry, I'm just looking at the chat. I, I, I would love to talk about that comment in, in the question period. Um, these are conditions that cannot be cured, but that can be controlled through medication and through lifestyle. Uh, choices so that they, in many points in uh, the individual's experience, have relatively little impact on day-to-day um, -day life and on experiences of health, but that also can um, in involve uh, flare-ups in the case of asthma or um, the development of clots in the case of thrombophilia that are very serious and can even be life-threatening. And based on the interviews, these authors distinguished between living with a long-term condition and living alongside of a long-term condition. And they say that folks who are able to live with their long-term condition are in a position to make informed decisions about their medications and about seeking treatment. They feel that they understand their health condition, both in the context of having a sense of the medical 
description of the condition and also in the sense of understanding how it affects their lives. Um, and this includes um, knowing when they need to pay more attention to their health. Um, as Rhoda said, I'll put it, um, people who live with their condition are aware of it most when it becomes necessary to be aware of it. And then by contrast, people who they consider to be living alongside of their condition have concerns about their condition, they pay attention to it, they focus on it, they limit their activities because of worry about their health condition. And the authors also say that people who are living alongside of their condition have not integrated it into their identity. A second study, sorry, um, by Debbie Kralik uh, involved uh, interviews with midlife women who are living or were living with a range of chronic illness. And she describes their experiences in terms of a uh, tension between or a balance between extraordinariness and ordinariness. So one way of thinking about extraordinariness is in the context of initial diagnosis of the condition, which required these women to come to terms with a sudden change in their lives. Um, they often had experiences that reflect the phenomenological description of the experience of illness. Um, Krolik puts it in terms of them falling out of touch with their bodies. Um, and they also had to come to terms with, in addition to physical changes, uh, psychological, social, and economic losses. But over time, many of these women were able to return to a state of ordinariness, where ordinariness is uh, a new ordinariness for them that Krolik says involves learning and identifying the changes that were necessary so that illness could have a place in their lives. She talks about this in terms of balance, empowerment, control, and reconstructing identity. And she also says that um, for many of these women, and this reflects the um, concerns of the previous study, there can be cycles between extraordinary phases and ordinary phases, depending on fluctuations in the symptom. So where I uh, spoke about extraordinariness in terms of the initial diagnosis, similar experiences could occur in cases where um, the illness was um, flaring up or where they were going through a, a bout of uh, difficulty with their illness. This next study by Sanderson et al. looked at the experiences of patients with rheumatoid arthritis. Excuse me. <coughs> and the researchers explicitly asked their participants what it meant to them to feel well with arthritis, um, what feeling well or feeling better meant, and also about returning to normal after diagnosis. And the themes that came up in these interviews included physical aspects of illness, so the ability to control symptoms through treatments to achieve pain reduction. Some of their participants were able to achieve enough symptom control to, as they put it, forget about the body. Um, other participants were not able to do this, so they included a range of people with a range of severity of their arthritis, including people who had irreversible joint damage. Um, they also reported that some of their participants considered themselves to be healthy, though others did not. Um, but they don't actually discuss the relationship between self-reported health and disease severity. Um, and they also mentioned this sense of control, the ability to um, both control their symptoms, uh, but also return to a certain kind of normal in, in their day to day lives. And then one final study um, by Widabara et al. Uh, they looked at people with musculoskeletal disorders, um, which include non specific neck, shoulder, and low back pain. So these are um, conditions that you know, compared to something like rheumatoid arthritis or asthma, there's uh, a bit more of a nebulous disease 
um, state about them, there may or may not be a clear impairment to point to. Um, and what they said is that their participants experienced health as having resources and opportunities to lead the life that they wanted. They also talked about good enough functioning, both in a physical sense and psychologically. And I'm just going to read this, this quote. Um, the researchers say that health was not only perceived as having a well-functioning body, it could also mean to have a less well-functioning body and to experience a sense of health despite physical disease. Ailments were seen as part of life, work, and aging. The body just had to function well enough to lead the life that one wants. Though they also say that pain experience is important, that the uh, acute experience of pain does diminish health for their participants. So this is far from a um, exhaustive or systematic review of the literature, but I think it's interesting that these papers do uh, surface some common themes in people's understanding of their own health uh, in terms of their, their life with a chronic health condition. So one important factor seems to be understanding one's health condition, uh, both in terms of feeling like they have been provided with enough medical information to understand the biology of their condition, but also understanding their lived experience and having a sense of what it is actually like to live with the condition um, and how that may change over time. Related to that is the importance of control. And here again, it's both the ability to control symptoms, but also to feel like People have a sense of control in living their own lives. Change over time is also important um, that many of these conditions involve periods where uh, people are able to achieve a, a sense of normalcy, to forget about the body, to even be largely symptom free. Um, and then finally, integration and identity. And I've sort of put these things together um, in part because of the alliteration, but also because I, um, I think that they are very closely related to each other. So integration refers more to um, the ability to integrate life with uh, a chronic illness and the things that need to be done when you are taking medications or being careful uh, about certain activities or changing some of the things that you do or the way that you do them or learning to use assistive devices there's a whole list of things that you're, you're able to integrate these things into your day-to-day -day, day -day life but you're also able to integrate them into your sense of who you are and this goes back to the rotus et al living with an illness as opposed to living alongside of it so again what i want to think about is how this qualitative research that looks at the experiences of people who are living with a chronic health condition but who are not debilitated or not always debilitated by their condition what that means for trying to develop an account of or even a definition of health and one thing i think it's interesting to note is that the three main approaches in philosophy of medicine all have something important to offer but all get something importantly wrong so naturalism, which focuses on disease and defines health in terms of the absence of disease, contributes the idea that biological health is important. So this literature often distinguishes between biological health and ill health or objective health and subjective health. And I said earlier that those things can come apart in some interesting and surprising ways. But I think it's important not to only think about the experience of illness without thinking about the physical and physiological changes that underlie it. That said, biological health doesn't actually require the absence of disease. You can have a disease and still have a significant level of biological health. Similarly, normativism is important because it emphasizes the ability to act and to achieve goals. But I worry a little bit about um, the emphasis on vital goals, on big goals, because I think it's really clear that for all of us, small goals matter. And in this literature, people will talk about the importance of 
being able to spend time with family and friends, being able to engage in hobbies, being able to get out. Um, and these are certainly not on a par with running a marathon, but I think these things matter, not just for people who may have health problems that preclude them from running a marathon, but for all of us. And then phenomenology contributes the uh, idea that feeling well, that the experience of health is important, but the problem with, again, the traditional approach to phenomenology is that we need to be able to think about feeling well and being healthy when people are in health states that preclude the kind of transparency and complacency that phenomenologists have uh, described the healthy body as having. So when I sent Harriet the abstract for this talk, I said that I was going to end up defending a modified version of the um, World Health Organization's definition of health. And honestly, I'm now thinking that the modifications that I am going to require are such that there's not much left of the, the definition. Because I think what I want to say is ultimately that health is a state of physical, mental, and social well-being and not the absence of disease. And so really, there's not much left there. But I don't think that's actually a problem because the second sentence, the sentence after this definition in the WHO's constitution really serves to contextualize the, the part of the definition that is, is quoted. So immediately after saying that health is a state of complete physical, mental, and social well-being, merely the absence of disease, the WHO goes on to say that the enjoyment of the highest attainable standards of health is one of the fundamental rights of every human being without distinction of race, religion, political belief, economic or social condition. And by talking about the highest attainable standard of health, I, I think that the kinds of um, states that I, I've been talking about and the kinds of experiences that the participants in the studies I've discussed are having um, really are compatible with the, the approach here. I think we could probably, you know, as philosophers, say a lot more about the relationship between those two sentences, but it, it's, it's pretty clear that the idealism uh, of the World Health Organization is um, tempered by the reality that the state of complete physical, mental, and social well-being is not something that is going to be attainable for everybody and maybe even not for anybody. So I think another way to think about this um, is to look at alternative ways of thinking about health. And again, these may be compatible with a well fleshed out understanding of the World Health Organization's definition, um, but I don't really have a strong view on that yet. Uh, so this is a quote from a 2006 paper by Norman Sartorius, who was the former director of the World Health Organization's Division for Mental Health. Um, he also opens with the classic definition, and he says that today three types of definition of health seem to be possible and are used. The first is that health is the absence of any disease or impairment. And we see here that Christopher Gorse and his theoretical account of health um, is using that definition. The second, sorry, the second is that health is a state that allows the individual to adequately cope with all demands of daily life, implying also the absence of disease and impairment. And I think if we eliminate the part in brackets, because it's possible to say that health is a state that allows people to cope even with disease or impairment, um, that that's a, an important thing to keep in mind. But ultimately, I think something like the third definition is the most promising, which is something to the effect that health is a state of balance and equilibrium that an individual has established within himself and between himself and his social and physical environment. And I think that that definition clearly is compatible with the idea that people can be healthy, even in the case of folks who have chronic health conditions. All right, I'm gonna stop sharing my screen.
thank you all very much. And thank you, Robin, for a, you know, a lovely talk and, and, and a thought provoking one, indeed. So we have some time for, for questions. Um, just to uh, tell people how to do this, um, you can, the, the best way to do it is, is to click on the participants list and then at the bottom you can see there's a blue hand you can raise. But if you prefer, you can put your question in, in the chat and we'll, we'll try and address those as well. So, um, so, well, we've got a number, we've got questions in, in different places. <laughs> I think, um, jo <laughs> okay, uh, Joseph, Joseph Millam, I think you, you were first, but we've also got questions in the, in the chat as well. So jo why don't you go first? Great, thanks very much. And Rowan, thanks ever so much for a really interesting and thought provoking talk. Uh, which covered a lot more about health than I think I had thought about before. <laughs> Thanks, Jeff. I was interested, especially as you were sort of going through this qualitative research and drawing out these different ways in which people understand health. I was interesting, interested in whether you thought about one of the um, key reasons why we want to have a concept of health, which is that we want to be able to measure ill health mm. we want to be able to measure ill health because we need to make decisions about how we're going to spend money on different ways that we could treat ill health um, and so i was wondering if the sort of preferred definition that you've come to do you think that that either informs how we should be measuring Ill health or fits or fails to fit with the tools that people have used to measure health and ill health So my short answer to that question is I was kind of hoping to hand that off to you. <laughs> um, yeah, I mean, I'm really right now focusing on the experience of health for individuals. That's the, the thing that is preoccupying me. Um, but I, I'm very aware that, um, you know, a lot of the, the motivation for the World Health Organization's definition was um, to set uh, an agenda for health promotion and for thinking about um, health in uh, broad population terms. Um, I'm also a little bit worried that if we completely relativize health to people's experience of health and to their ability to achieve equilibrium that uh, we're ignoring a lot of um, discrepancies related to uh, things like education and socioeconomic standards because people will potentially have very diff different senses of what being healthy means for them or what their expectations might be and I worry that people who are willing to settle for less will get less um, but I think that there's a huge gulf between um, you know thinking about health in the context of individual care and thinking about the kind of priority setting that, that you're focusing on. I don't know that the definition that I'm working with will be useful for those purposes. Um, my colleague Sean Vias has talked a lot about the um, World Health Organization definition and he argues that um, it's really an umbrella concept and that within that we should develop and work through different definitions of health for different purposes. And I think there's something really important going on there so that while the things that I'm thinking about might potentially be useful, the fact that they are not useful for priority setting, should that be the case, is not uh, a problem for the definition in terms of the problems that I'm working with. Yeah, that makes that makes sense. Thanks. I guess I would think just maybe recommend to you looking at tools like the EQ5D, which I think actually might be quite consistent with some of the, some of the been thinking about health in terms of what they care about, mobility, self-care, pain, anxiety, really things to do with people's lived experience. So I think it might not be so distant as all that. Thank you. Uh, Thanks, Joe and, and, and Robin. I will address questions in the chat in a moment, but let's have uh, Polly first, Polly Mitchell. 
Thanks. Um, thank you, Robin, for setting out these issues so clearly. Um, so I had a question. So your, the definition of health which you provide kind of goes some way to sort of eliding um, the distinction between health and well-being, mm -hmm. and as does the WHO definition. And I was wondering whether the definition you're offering is intended to be descriptive, so an account of how people we actually talk about health or prescriptive like an account of how we ought to talk about health or maybe somewhere in between and obviously you, you're drawing on empirical literature uh, so there's some sense in which it's descriptive um, mm -hmm. which I guess led me to think um, to what extent should how a certain group subgroup of people people with chronic um, illness talk about health to what extent should that largely shape a more general definition? Mm -hmm. So, I did mention earlier that there's a close link between health and well-being, and my sense is that both in philosophy and in um, empirical research on health, people both align those two concepts. Um, fairly regularly and use each of them in different ways. Um, I think I would want to say that the issue is not so much the distinction between health and well-being as it is the distinction between health related to disease or illness and health in a broader sense. Um, I mean, at the, the risk of sounding like a total philosopher, you know, we, we use health in all kinds of different ways. Like we, we talk about a healthy attitude or a healthy portion or something like that. And, it, and not all of those are directly related to either well-being or, or medical health. Um, I think in thinking about um, Callahan's worry that including social well-being in health is expanding the concept too much. Um, you know, on the one hand, I agree that um, poverty and crime are not medical problems, but I think it's also very clear that they are health problems and well-being problems. And so maybe the distinction that I will want to make when I'm finished thinking about this, should that happen, um, is not between health and well-being, but between the aspects of health that are relevant to medicine and healthcare and the aspects of health that are relevant to broader issues. I'm not sure that completely answers your question. No, thank you. That's helpful. And I'll, I'll let other people ask questions. Thank you. Thanks, Pauline. Thanks. Thanks, Robin. I'd like if we could to address a couple of questions that have popped up in, in the, the chat. Um, uh, actually, I, perhaps I can put them together. There's one from, from the Ursula started off, off with, which was just uh, connecting what you were saying with some of the uh, literature and the disability studies area. Yeah, and she says, in terms of the binary notion of the able versus disabled mm -hmm. body. Uh, and then, um, then both she and um, Anthony, uh, Anthony David, asked about the relationship between what you're saying uh, uh, with thinking about physical health and mental health right. and, um you, you is are you covering both or just just one and you know, ursula sort of points out well she is sort of, you might be able to see what she has to say she says you know, many people you know, so deal as it were with lockdown which we've been thinking of, of in terms of mental health effects but they, they deal with it all the time um um, someone experiencing extreme pain is, is not necessarily an enlightening experience. Anyway, so um, yeah, so this idea of a sort of state of balance might be difficult for them. Um, so there are a number of questions there: what your disability, mental health, and perhaps as it were, some some quite serious chronic problems. Yeah, yeah. Um, so in terms of disability, this is something that I have also been trying to think about, and. Um, I do think that there are some really important insights in the critical disability studies literature and the philosophy of disability that are completely relevant to the things that I'm talking about. But I, I want to think very carefully about just smushing that together with the philosophy of medicine literature. 
uh, for a couple of reasons. One is that there's disagreement in disability studies about um, the relationship between disability and chronic illness. So some people want to draw a distinction between those and others want to say that no, chronic illness is or can be a kind of disability. And I think that is uh, a really fruitful debate to be thinking about. Um, hi. <laughs> And um, I, I do want to do that, uh, but I didn't think I could manage doing that today. So yes, absolutely. I think there are um, commonalities and resonances and also differences between the literature that are really important. Um, in terms of mental health and physical health, um, I think I want to say something very similar. So I think in some ways that yes, um, things that we classify as mental disorders or mental disabilities or mental differences um, do have similar effects on people's lives to physical uh, ailments and physical conditions. Um, but like with disability studies, I, I'm I'm very aware that for people who reject the idea that um, diagnosis, a mental illness diagnosis is truly an illness that, um, you know, there, there's good reason to think about those things separately. Um, that said, I think that the kind of suffering and the effects on people's lives of um, things that are symptoms of mental disorders, so feeling of feelings of um, depression or of anxiety, just to take some of the, the more common ones. I, I think that they do clearly have very um, significant effects on health and well-being, and that finding some kind of equilibrium might be difficult in in similar ways to the way that the experience of acute, acute pain. Uh, makes it harder to achieve equilibrium, but I don't want to rule out the fact that, or the, the possibility that it, it could happen. Um, and just picking up on um, Marcus's point about uh, the network theory of mental disorders, um, I think that that's a really interesting suggestion because you know if, if what we're doing is we're focusing on symptoms and experiences rather than diagnosis, then yeah, I think absolutely there's interesting things to think about there. Thank, thank you, Robin. Um, let's move back to the, 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 the blue hands. First is Jill Gensler and then, then Kian Munswu after, after Jill. Um, thank you very much. Um, and thank you, Robin, for your paper. I really, I really enjoyed it. Thank you. Um, I think my, my question is related, um, and I want to go back to some of the issues that um, Joseph uh, Millam and Polly Mitchell um, uh, raised, and I, I'm going to put it in slightly different terms, and that is, I want to, um, this, because this, <laughs> as all of our questions do, they always come from what we're particularly interested in, but one thing I'm really interested in is the question, what is it that we're doing when we ask these questions in philosophy like, what does it mean, um, or what it, uh, to be healthy, or what is the proper definition um, of, of health? And sometimes it, it in, in the way in which you were talking, it sounded like there's one right answer. Um, right. And, and, um, and, that, and when you say things like, and what we're, our goal is, is to find the true definition. Um, and sometimes the, the way you talk, like when you were talking about Boris, you said he gets something importantly wrong, uh, mm -hmm. right? When, when he gives this particular definition and then and you point that out. And I'm wondering whether, um, instead of thinking about um, what it is that we're doing in that particular way, we could see ourselves as a, acknowledging the possibility that um, different people have a different concept in mind when they use the word um, health. And what we philosophers can do is analyze what that concept is and then ask the question, is that useful? Um, and, and, you know, for, for various um, purposes. So as you said, Bohr's um, definition might be very useful to the pathologist who is interested in, um, in health and, and people in the World Health Organization who want to smuggle in as much of well-being into the concept of, of health that people acknowledge as important, that might be really useful um, uh, for them. And, and we can go 
through the, you know, the various ones, the normative, the phenomenological, but they're all different concepts of health. And it's not that one's right or one's wrong or that we need to have one that combines all of them, but that we can acknowledge their differences and see their, their different practical values. So that's the one question. And then the follow-up to that would be, what's the advantage that you, if, if you agree with that view of what it is that we're doing, what do you see are the advantages of your definition um, of health? What practical role can it play in, cer in certain contexts? Yeah, so my worry about my talk is exactly the opposite of yours. I was worried that I was relativizing health too much to individual people's experiences of health, because I, I really do think it's important to take seriously um, that when somebody says that they are healthy, they probably are. Um, and, you know, I, given the range of conditions uh, somebody might be in and still feel that they're healthy, my, my worry is that we're not going to be able to say something about what they have in common. And then um, picking up on part of my answer to Joe, I also don't like the idea of just completely deferring to um, individuals to say what makes them healthy because um, you know, I, I think that there's a world of difference between somebody who uh, is finding transcendence and grace in the midst of um, serious health challenges. And I don't want to diminish the importance of that to, to people, but I, I think that only certain kinds of people are going to think that way. And they are probably largely going to be fairly privileged people. And then on the other hand, I, I didn't end up talking about this study, but um, there, there was one where that, uh, you know, that, I think the title was something like, you just get on with your day. And so, you know, somebody's experience of health, even though they are suffering and uh, have difficulty doing things, they're healthy because they can live their life. And so, you know, I'm worried that the relativism, uh, relativizing health to the individual is going to not be able to, um, uh, not not be able to give us a social level of health. Um, I also think that you know, as a, a philosopher, as philosophers, we are really good at sussing out the differences and the similarities in what people are saying. So providing some sort of account of, as you say, the different ways that people use the term health or talk about health, that is something that we're actually useful for. Um, but I also think that um, that has to be compatible with taking some sort of normative stand, um, in part because I want to, <laughs> um, but also because I think that, um, you know, just uh, laying things out without any kind of account of the implications of accepting some view or other leaves it up to um, other people to make those, uh, to, to take that extra step. And I think that we are just as entitled as philosophers to participate in that conversation as healthcare providers and policymakers. Just, just one sh um, short follow-up. I, I agree with that point. And I think what we can do in addition to the analysis of the concept is to talk about the ethics of using the concepts in particular ways by, by seeing what what would be the ways in which using concepts in a certain way, how that would affect um, our society and our interactions with one another. Yeah, yeah. And one of the things that I find really interesting about this uh, area is that there is not as much discussion between many philosophers of medicine and many bioethicists as I think that there should be. Um, as somebody who, depending on the day and what I'm thinking about kind of thinks of myself as both. Um, I, I think that we really should be thinking more about the relationships between those two fields. Um, I also noticed that although um, philosophers of medicine do mention the World Health Organization definition of health, it's really the bioethicists that have, um, and the bioethicists and, and people in the medical field who have been engaging with it. And it's odd to me 
wearing my philosopher of medicine hat that we don't. Thanks, Molly. Thanks, Jill. Um, Kian has been waiting patiently. It's over. Thank you very much. Uh, uh, thanks very much, uh, Ron Bloom. I, I, I really enjoyed that, and I think you did a great job of, of laying out the field. Thank so you. my question um, nicely follows on from, from Jill Gensler's because it's also sort of methodological. So um, part of uh, the point of your talk was to um, uh, draw attention to incorporating sort of chronic, chronic conditions and these sorts of things into our conceptions of ourselves. Um, but it seems to me that the purpose of a lot of the theories of health is not so much to how to respond to certain conditions, but uh, under which conditions we, under which circumstances we would not want to generate them or we want to avoid them or spend mm -hmm. scarce resources to avoid them and so forth. So I'm sort of wondering if perhaps there's um, either contrasting goals or maybe even stronger talking past each other in terms of what you're aiming at. So yours is sort of saying, well, look, here we can um, respond to certain phenomenological conditions where we have these, whereas these other uh, theories of health are trying to figure out when we want to uh, privilege avoiding them and that sort of question. So hopefully that makes sense as a concern. No, it does. It absolutely does. Um, and I think this is another area where trying to think about the people, the, the contributions of people who have been writing about disability is really important because, um, you know, just as there are surprising empirical studies that show that people can have very uh, severe health conditions and be experiencing symptoms and be experiencing limitations in their daily life, but still feel healthy. Um, you know, there, there are all kinds of people who have disabilities and have written about having disabilities and who want to um, very much, uh, you know, they, they want to argue against the idea that it would be better not to have the, the particular disability or the particular impairment that they have. And um, I honestly don't know how to navigate the balance between um, respecting that and learning from it and still um, wanting to improve health. So I, I, I guess I don't have an answer to your question, but I'm aware that it's a very, very good one. And can I just point to Marika's question in the chat? Um, yes. So uh, the issues about the gradual diminishment of function with aging, and we know that as people get older, they um, will develop chronic diseases in addition to whatever you know, healthy diminishment of function is necessary. Um, that is also something that I have avoided thinking about in this talk, but um, certainly one of the um, things that I think can help people to adjust to a health condition is um, the extent to which it's expected. So um, having a diagnosis of a serious illness when you're in your 20s is going to be very different than when you're in your 60s. And um, again, I think that goes back a little bit to the integration question, uh, thinking about how to um, incorporate uh, one's sense of oneself and one's sense of one's illness or health or bodily afflictions. Great, thanks. Thanks so much, Robin. Um, what I'm going to well, Robin's kindly agreed to 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 allow us to run on for a bit and keep continue asking her questions that have uh, developed from her your, her lovely and stimulating talk. Um, so, um, but appreciate some people may have other things to, to go to, so we'll have to, have to say goodbye to them. But 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 um, so what I'd like to do now, there's a there was an interesting there's an interesting question from Moshi in the chat, and he he did Moshi did have a hand. She or he did have a hand, but um, yeah, sorry, and, and to provide that context, and it's why don't you give your question? I'll you and, and then yeah. uh, I should provide thank you so much. I should provide context here and, and why my question might be unfair for a philosopher. Uh, mm -hmm. I'm a teaching fellow uh, in global health, mm -hmm. so I'm actually guilty. I do teach the definition of WHO <laughs> with yeah. some criticism around it as much as I can. Um, so, so on the practical end of things, right? So, uh, and and we we always myself I criticize these universal attempts at you know definitions and initiatives and all of that. Um, uh, but it's actually I must confess I kind of like that definition. 
to an extent, right? And and I've myself I've thought of alternatives, and and mm -hmm. I'm, of course I'm not a philosopher, so I, I tend to delegate and think, okay, someone else should do this work, and I think you're the perfect uh, victim to ask this question. Um, I mean, in terms of your definition, what, how much do you think that would travel? Uh, because as much as I like it, I, I don't see, um, in my opinion, too much of cross-country, cross-cultural appeal mm -hmm. to it, right? I could see how that could fit with, you know, America or the Western sensibilities around wellness and so forth. But, you know, like, if we are going to replace the WHO definition, do you, do you think that would be the alternative or... Are you suggesting something rather particularistic, if you will, uh, and that can or probably just is more applicable to the global north? Um, I, I think this is a fair question, and I don't have a, an answer to it. I think that whatever an answer would look like, it's similar to the things that I was saying earlier about um, my worries about the influence of socioeconomic status on people's perceived health, that um, people who are relatively privileged will have potentially very different expectations for their own health and for what state would allow them to be healthy. And, um, and I, this also, I think, ties back to Joe's question about resource allocation. I, I, I'm, I think that there are analogous but um, not identical problems, sort of thinking vertically within a society versus thinking horizontally. I don't want to sound like a flat earther when I say horizontally, but you know, you get the, the idea uh, across the, the globe. And um, this is not my area of research, and I haven't really thought about how universal this is, but I would have the same concerns. Um, about the potential for uh, people in under-resourced countries who know that there um, is not adequate health care available to be satisfied with less than they deserve. Great. Um, Julian, you've been waiting. Nice to see you again. Uh, Julian, and then I'll go to what, like, Sally, Sally's question in the chat. Nice to see you too. Um... I wanted to go back to the mental health question and how to think about uh, health within illness in, in the case of uh, psychiatric conditions. Um, so you might think that one of the things that CBT tries to do is, is give you some kind of distance from your symptoms so that you can, you can find that right kind of uh, attitude towards your illness so that you know, that is a kind of finding health within uh, mental illness was that the sort of thing that you were thinking of for the mental illness case or uh, did you have something else in mind there um i i think cbt could potentially be a way of achieving that for some people absolutely um but i also am thinking about um and kathleen i know that you were here at one point so i just want to shout out to kathleen lowenstein um, who's been thinking about this stuff with me, um, thinking about uh, the neurodiversity and uh, pride critiques of psychiatry and about the importance of offering people alternative ways of thinking about mental health diagnoses and communities of support for people who are experiencing um, potentially distressing conditions. I think that that's another very important potential resource. Um, but I also am not sure that it's going to be robust enough anytime soon that this can be something we can rely on. So maybe CBT is um, more doable at the moment. Yeah, but if, if you have the, the support network idea, then I think that maybe combats something of the individualist worry that you are having. Right. Then Know, thinking about balance as well in relation to, to the social environment. And right. you can think of it as depending on socioeconomic status, whether you can achieve that balance or not. Um, yeah. I, I, I don't think your, your account of health needs to be uh, taken in an individualist way necessarily, which 
have the environmental context in play and think of balance as relative to that environmental context. Right. Um, and I think too that um, you know we the aspect of social well-being, you know, a lot gets packed into that. So um, resources, um, both healthcare resources and personal financial resources, because of course one of the things that tends to increase people's assessment of their own health is a certain amount of economic comfort and stability. Um, and, and then also um, personal networks, families and friends, but also the sort of more political networks that, um, you know, the, the way that people think about um, the particular health condition that you have. So another one of the papers that I did not talk about, but had, have been reading, looked at people who have gout. And one of the things that they were saying is that, you know, people, um, think that gout is funny in a way because they are not familiar with it. They think of it as, you know, Henry VIII. And um, mm -hmm. there, there's a lot of odd stigma attached to that. And, and so I think that, um, you know, going back to your initial question about mental health, that the, the ways that socially we tend to think about particular conditions also play a huge role in people's ability to cope with them. And Can you say again the name of your collaborator? I didn't quite catch it. The person oh, that you're working um, on mental health. Uh, Kathleen, are you, do you want to unmute and say hi? <laughs> are you still here? Uh, so it's um, Kathleen Lowenstein. Kathleen Lowenstein. Okay, thanks very much. I'd, li I'd like now to, to um, go to Sally King's quite rather nice question in the chat. I'll, I'll read it out just so that in case people can't see it. Um, so she, Sally writes, um, I work in menstrual health. Menstruation is often painful and can impact on an individual's ability to achieve vital goals or maintain a sense of well-being. However, menstruation is a healthy bodily process that enables human reproduction and ultimately functions to protect life of the individual by preemptively eliminating potentially fatally dangerous or costly pregnancies. I think this example could help tease out some of the paradoxical elements of the definitions of both health and disease, question mark. And then she puts in parentheses, I'm not a philosopher though. Uh, <laughs> however, this is precisely the kind of example that a defender of naturalism might try to use to say, look, you, some, some things are perfectly healthy, but they you know, don't make you feel very well, you're quite sure. unwell, um, but you're still healthy. Um, yeah, and then, then that might support naturalism, they, they would say. What, what do you think? So, so she's, she's a very good philosopher, Sally, I think. That's right, there you go. Um, yeah, I think that's a really interesting example. And I think it's also worth noting, you know, the, the mere fact that there is a, a field of menstrual health suggests that um, while it can be painful and impact on the abil an individual's ability to achieve vital goals, um, that is more true for some people than others. And even though it is a natural process and, and not a disease in any way, um, certainly people who are experiencing bodily suffering and uh, inability to interact with the world in, in the way that they normally would do. I mean, I, I don't see a problem as with considering that to be a health problem, even though it's not a disease. Um, I'm just sort of looking at the, the question to see if there's stuff that I've missed. Um, yeah, I, I think you're right um, that, you know, the philosophy of medicine literature, you know, I, I, there's a lot of work on the medicalization of reproductive health and women's reproductive health in particular. Um, but I, I do think that you know, the example poses a challenge for the traditional views. So thank you. I was wondering if we've got, I mean, there's lots we could go on, but possibly one last one, perhaps, you know, perhaps the most suitable question to, 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 to finish with is one from um, Tim there, which goes back to the WHO definition. It says, um, could this be taken as um, representative of um, the contemporary accepted view at the time that um, medicine and science should be on a 
path to progress. Yeah. And this is the sort of medical version of that. Medicine, you ought to be able to rid society of ills, um, e even if today they are incurable and chronic. Um, yes, it's uh, admittedly rather utopian, but perhaps that's, you know, that, that reflects a vision for the future, you know, an aim, an utopian goal of eliminating disease, disease, you know, something to aim for. And if we, he says, if we redefine the notion of health to admit illness, um, um, it does this also signal a, an abandonment of, utopia, of this utopian goal to which it's reasonable to, uh, to strive. Yeah, um, I, I think that it is exactly right that the, the definition does reflect uh, an optimism about the future of science and the ability of science to solve all the problems. Uh, and that we are, I think, you know, if anything, we've gone too far the other way. We've got lots of people who just don't want to accept that science has anything to offer. Um, but. I suspect those folks are not here. Um, so uh, I, I agree that there, there's something to that. Um, I think if we think about the definition as articulating an ideal, um, even though we know that the ideal is unachievable for anyone, much less for everyone, that it you know, can possibly be kind of motivating and um, you know, a, a useful thing to think about, even though, you know, we all secretly know that that's not what is going to happen. Um, sorry, just looking at the question again. Yeah, I mean, I think you can be optimistic without being utopian and holding on to some optimism is a really good idea. I think that was a very suitable point at which to 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 end. And we all feel sort of optimistic after a, 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 a fantastic talk, beautifully clear and stimulating uh, at the same time. So thank you very much indeed, Robin, for being the 2020 Peter Sowerby uh, lecturer. Um, and thank you very much to the audience for, for being here, for excellent uh, questions. Um, you can use, if you wish, um, the the reactions button to raise your hands <laughs> and wave. Unfortunately, we would, I'm sure we would all be clapping very loudly uh, if we were in uh, the lecture theatre together, which sadly we 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 aren't. But at least this gave us an opportunity to you know, to, to, to to think further afield than than we normally would have done, and that, that's been been great to have you, Robin. Thank you very much in, indeed. Thank you very much for having me. I really enjoyed being here. And uh, my email is on my slides, but I'm also Googleable. So I know we didn't get a chance to uh, address all the questions, and I'd love to continue the conversation with anybody who's in there. Thank you. Thanks very much, everybody, and um, have a good have a good night. Thank you. Bye. Thank you, Robin. Thank you.